welcome to Season 2, Episode 2 of Mike Cadaver's Horror Pub Trivia. I'm Betty Cadaver. I'm Mike Cadaver, and we are coming from the Cadaver Tavern, and we got some tasty trivia all for you, Damien. How many of these fine folks do you think are actually using that? I don't know, but they should be. And let me tell you something, guys. We got a QR code on the screen that you can go ahead and look up right now, and it will take you to the website where you can play right along. So we're starting this one with a warm-up round to make sure there are no injuries. That's good, because we talked about that last episode. You know what we're going to do right now? Let's just bring in the, the, the trivia gorilla, and let's have him tell you what's going on. Oh, oh, oh. Just your everyday trivia gorilla here. <laughs> Here's how this all works. The idea of this is that you're in your favorite pub playing trivia with your friends. For each episode, we'll have three rounds of 10 questions. The rounds get harder, so if you're using our app, later rounds are worth more points. Speaking of the app, visit trivia.horrorpubtrivia.com Tom, all the information you need is there. If you don't use the app, a regular pen and paper will work too. Other than that, prepare yourself for spoilers and have fun. <laughs> like we said earlier, this is your warm-up round. All we're looking for here is the name of the movie we're describing. Sounds pretty straightforward. Let's get into it. Question number one. This alien invasion movie from 2023 revolves around a woman who killed her best friend with a rock. Question number two. This rockabilly slasher from 1987 features a killer with a drill on the stem of his guitar. Question number three. This film from 1932 is directed by James Well, stars Boris Karloff, and is about some travelers who are forced to stay the night in an old house. Question number four. This 2008 film marks the return of Coffin Joe after 41 years and completes the Coffin Joe trilogy. Question number five. This 2014 film by Astron 6 is about a shamed film editor and is a satire of the giallo genre. Question number six. This radioactive mutant film from the early 80s takes place in Idaho, stars Martin Landau, and is directed by Jackie Kong. Question number seven. 
This 2011 direct sequel to The Wicker Man is also directed by Robin Hardy. Question number eight. This werewolf movie from 1996 stars Mariel Hemingway and Michael Paré. Question number 9. This 1991 tiny creature feature is about the titular creatures going to college. Question number 10. This 2019 religious horror film is about what a Jewish man keeping watch over a newly dead body experiences during his patrol. Number 1. This alien invasion movie from 2023 revolves around a woman who killed her best friend with a rock. No one will save you. Sorry about the spoiler right at the beginning of this episode, but man, this was a tough one for me. I like the alien action in the design, but it still boggles my mind that our heroine was someone who killed her best friend with a rock and had a happy ending. I understand that this was about trauma and overcoming your guilt, but I could not get over how we're supposed to be sympathetic to the main character. Ah oh well, the internet seems to disagree with me on this since it's been getting pretty decent reviews. Number 2. This rockabilly slasher from 1987 features a killer with a drill on the stem of his guitar. Slumber Party Massacre 2. If you believe that a guitar can be a phallic symbol for the male guitar player, then the guitar in this has to be the John Holmes of guitars. Not only does it have the regular parts of a guitar, but has a two-foot drill bit spinning at the tip making it the baddest, most penis-y guitar of all time. This movie takes a left turn from the original Slumber Party Massacre in that it includes rockabilly tunes being sung by our killer dressed in a leather with his slick back hair dancing around as he kills. Classic 80s dairy. Though it stars Crystal Bernard from Wings fame, this is one of those classic 80s B-horror movies where the characters' faces are familiar from other classic 80s B-horror movies. The best thing about this movie, though, is that it proves that chicks at slumber parties still have topless pillow fights, which gives me hope for this godforsaken plan. Number 3. This film from 1932 is directed by James Whale, stars Boris Karloff, and is about some travelers who are forced to stay the night in an old house. The Old Dark House. Although this may not be the film that James Whale is primarily known for, it's still a great film. Instead of electricity giving back human life or men looking in mirrors but casting no reflection, this film relies on pure atmosphere to make its case. Number 4. This 2008 film marks the return of Coffin Joe after 41 years and completes the Coffin Joe trilogy. Embodiment of Evil Jose Mojica Marins is quite a character. All three of these films tell the story of Coffin Joe and his quest to become immortal by finding a worthy female to bury his child, thus continuing his bloodline. He's a Brazilian hero. My question is this, he's a little weird undertaker who has very abrasive and he's kind of a dick, yet he manages to find people to follow him and help him in his quest. In the first two movies, he was just a bully with a unibrow, an embodiment of evil, he was an octogenarian with grotesquely long fingernails and ear and nose hair protruding from their respective holes. Yet he still managed to get followers and bang a couple of hot chicks. I guess it's somebody we all strive to be. Number 5. 
This 2014 film by Astron 6 is about a shamed film editor and is a satire of the giallo genre. The editor. Sometimes a comedian, or in this case, a comedian troupe, comes along and blows me away with the way they deliver their humor. I'd already seen Father's Day from 2011, which is produced by Astron 6. That was one of the most clever and hilarious films I'd seen up to that point. Or at least it really spoke to my sense of humor. Enter the editor from 2014 and you get more of the same, but it was more refined and specialized. That's probably because the subject matter was more specific. Instead of a film about a serial killer who kills fathers, this was a very clever satire of the giallo film genre. Instead of creating jokes that could be understood by the public at large, Astron 6 took a very specific genre of film and made very specific jokes about it. Number 6. This radioactive mutant film from the early 80s takes place in Idaho, stars Martin Landau, and is directed by Jackie Kong. The Bean. Jackie Kong is a dang treasure for bringing us Blood Diner from 1987. Even though The Bean isn't quite as lauded as Blood Diner, it is great 80s dairy. Starring Martin Landau as a chemical engineer who, along with the mayor, played by Jose Ferrer, is trying to prove that despite toxic waste dumping, the water is just fine to drink. Well, it wouldn't be a movie if the water was fine and everything was good, oh no. We get a sweet one-eyed guts monster doing its best to decapitate and otherwise off the residents of this small Idaho town. Question 7. This 2011 direct sequel to The Wicker Man is also directed by Robin Hardy. The Wicker Tree. Whereas in The Wicker Man we had a detective as the pure in heart Christian man who would become the pagan sacrifice, well, in this one, we get a cringe country singing missionary in her cowboy bow that lay waste to any cred this film could have had. Though it stars a very respectable Graham McTavish, he along with Lolly, played by Honeysuckle Weeks, and the fact that she made it a habit of being butt naked a lot, that couldn't even save this movie. Number 8. This werewolf movie from 1996 stars Mariel Hemingway and Michael Paré. Bad Moon. Remember early on in Mariel Hemingway's career when she had a unibrow? I don't really have anything else to say about that, I just thought it was weird. Anyhow, this mid-90s werewolf film is grotesquely overlooked. Michael Paré plays Ted, a journalist who was attacked by a werewolf while on location in Nepal. He comes home, but he brought something with him. Something that comes once a month and causes havoc on him and those around him. No, he does not menstruate. Either way, this is a very decent werewolf flick starring a couple of real names. Apparently the only difference between the theatrical and director's cuts of this film was one portion of Ted's transformation that Eric Red, the director, took out because he didn't like the way it looked. Apparently at the time of the commentary on the director's cut, Red talked about how much he hated it, and he said he'd been hearing complaints about that for nearly as long. But I'm not sure that I've seen it, so well. Number 9. This 1991 tiny creature feature is about the titular creatures going to college. Ghoulies 3, Ghoulies Go to College. As we know, only the most educated and refined are fans of this franchise. I mean, it takes a certain sense of wealth and taste to understand the profundity of the tagline, they'll get you in the end. Directed by John Carl Beekler and starring Kevin McCarthy, better known as the asshole in the movie UHF. I mean, that is if any human could really star in these movies. We all know that the Ghoulies themselves are the stars of this franchise. I'm just glad the Ghoulies finally understood what higher education is all about. Brewskis, babes, and partying hardy. They may flunk out on manners, but they get an A in mayhem. They put the animal back in the house. Number 10. This 2019 religious horror film is about what a Jewish man keeping watch over a newly dead body experiences during his patrol. The Vigil. We do a complete 180 in tone from Ghoulies 3 to this one. Based on the idea of Shemira, which is a Jewish ritual of watching over a deceased person from the time they pass away to the time their burial, to protect them from evil. This film is about what happens when evil has something to say during that time of the vigil. Atmospheric and serious, this film does a great job of creeping the viewer out. Also, since I'm not Jewish, it's interesting culturally, especially when it comes to explaining what a mazik is. All right, I'm Betty Cadaver, and we have... Aubrey Hatfield. Aubrey Hatfield. Okay, let's get it started. We're going to have you pick a card. Okay. Did you, did you tell you about this? Got to get five right? Got to get five 
Okay. Oh, here we go. In Reanimator, 1985, reanimation is made possible by which of the following? Injection, electricity, magic, or artificial intelligence? Injection. <gasps> Correct. <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on. Injection. Correct. Okay. <laughs> All right. In The Loved Ones, 2009, what two letters encircled by a heart does Lola Stone carve into the chest of protagonist Brent Mitchell? B-H. I mean, you were really close. Oh, give me an answer. B-H. Uh, you were really close, but it's L and S, her initials. <laughs> <laughs> one for one. <laughs> All right. Um, what is the name of the coastal town celebrating its centennial in The Fog, 1980? Oh, man. I'm blanking on that one. <laughs> Give me a city. Give me a city. You got a guess, man. You got it. Astoria? Ast Estonia? Astoria. Astoria? Where's Astoria? Uh, it's New York City. Oh, okay. <laughs> I liked it. I liked I was it. Pretty far off of that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're all done. Oh, but thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Okay, I'm Betty Cadaver, and we have Chaz. Okay, Chaz, we're gonna ask you some questions. See if you can get them right. Okay, you get to pick a card. Oh, there we go. Several cards. Okay, mm -hmm. are you ready? Yes. Um, what liquid in Signs 2002 turns out to be instrumental in defeating the alien invaders? That would be, oh, that would be RC Cola. That is wrong. I know. It's, it's shocking. I mean, it, it, was water, it was water, but, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I liked it. I liked it. it was, okay. All right. You got to, so we got to get the rest right on this. So what, I'll five, five app. more? <laughs> yeah. Are they all uh, five No, these okay. are, we're all different. Yeah. Gotcha. Let's see. At the 75th Golden Globe Awards, Get Out 2017, it was nominated for Best Motion Picture in what category? Best original screenplay. Or is that the, my misunderstanding the question? I don't know. Did I say it right? Are we right? <laughs> yeah, the 75th Golden Globe Awards. Get oh, out. Golden Globes. Oh, I was, I was thinking of the other. Uh, um, musical or comedy? I think I oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Okay. All right. The movie that terrified me as a child. In the ring, 2002, how many days after watching the Sinister videotape does one meet their doom? Seven? Correct. You know, core memory of mine. Let's see. Okay. It's an amazing Prince song, too. Seven days? Yeah. Seven days and a... I don't, I don't know it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> In the Silence of the Lambs, 1991, uh, with what kind of beans does Hannibal Lecter say he ate with the liver of a census stalker? Talk. That would be fava beans. Is that what he does? <laughs> That's yeah. gross. Okay. Uh, I hear actually with the canty it goes phenomenally. But but of course, look who's telling me that. The guy. Huh? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of like <laughs> oh. Yeah. Questionable culinary <laughs> endeavors, but. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not gonna be able to say these names. What is, what is, what, how do you say that? What is that? You do your best. You don't know either? No. Okay. Peter Bogdanovich? No. no. Okay. And a tale of two sisters, 2003. What is the relationship between Imju and Sumi? They are stepsisters. Almost. Half-sisters. No. Oh, Stepmother and stepdaughter. Oh, stop. <laughs> You know, but thanks for playing with us. I was thinking of the step-by-step -step on TGIF and just, you know, and that leads to all downfalls. So. 
I mean, you said yeah. step, and I was like, ah, oh, he's got to get it. Uh, I, really, I really stepped into that one. I'm really, I'm really glad you knew what I was talking about, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> and knowing you the best. Yeah, right? Okay. <laughs> so, no, well, thank you. Appreciate it. I appreciate you. Yeah, have a good one. Thank you. My lords and ladies, geeks, geekerellas, geekulas, and geekeritas, I am Lord Blood Draw, host of Lord Blood Draw's Nerve Rackin' Theater, and you are watching OSI 74. Because let's face it, what has reality done for you lately? So let us remember the past, honor the present, and be amused by the future. I predict that you will invest in a piece of film history, the original black backdrop for night scenes in the 1959 cult classic Plan 9 from Outer Space was amazingly found at Quality Studios during the making of a documentary. One and a half to two inch squares were affixed to a certificate of authenticity signed by Plan 9 actor Conrad Brooks and Buddy Barnett of cult movies. This is a limited edition collectible and when they're gone, they're gone. A must for every Ed Wood fan. Order yours today for only $29.99. Free shipping in the U.S. Can you prove it didn't happen? Order today, only $29.99. Visit us at osi74.com or call us at 1-321-252-4574. movies on your computer and on the TV. Somebody need parental guidance. Y'all don't be scared. Turn into midnight frights. Okay, so it's about time we give these folks a challenge. You are right. And this round is called Humble Beginnings. Basically what it is, we will name a movie, and you give us the name of a Hollywood A-lister that acted in it before they got their huge break into superstardom. Like their first role ever? Sometimes, sometimes not, but it was before they were a household name. Kind of like our show right now? <laughs> yeah, exactly like that. <laughs> Question number one, Friday the 13th. Question number two, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. Question number three, Hellraiser 4, Floodline. Question number four, Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. Question number five, Children of the Corn Five, Filled of Terror. Question number six, He Knows You're Alone.
Question number seven, cutting class. Question number eight, phenomena. Question number nine, leprechaun. Question number 10, Critters 3. Number 1. Friday the 13th Kevin Bacon. This is a pretty easy one. We all know that Kevin Bacon was in the first group of teen camp counselors when Pamela Voorhees went batshit crazy. He seemed like a nice kid except for those premarital sex and smoking of the weed. If you keep your eyes peeled, you also get a nice close-up shot of Kevin Bacon's, uh, uh, bacon. All stuffed into a little speedo. Number 2. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation Matthew McConaughey. If I had three words to describe this movie, they'd be all right, all right, all right. Oh, sorry. Low hanging fruit, so I had to do it. You know I did. At the time of this movie, McConaughey had already made a splash in Dazed and Confused with his line about high school girls. That was fine, but it wasn't until this flick that he showed us just how crazy he could sing. In his audition, he was tasked with taking a spoon and scaring director Kim Henkel's secretary. Apparently, he did such a great job that he was hired on the spot. Number 3, Hellraiser 4, Bloodline Adam Scott The argument rages on as to when the original Hellraiser series actually started going downhill. Was it in Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, where there was a Cenobite shooting CDs out of his face at innocent bystanders? Or is it this one that actually takes place in space? Argue all you want. I like both. Uh, Adam Scott plays Jacques, Le Marchand's assistant who betrays him to be with a demon from Hell, Angelique. Let's be real. Not sure if any man would have been strong enough to make a different choice. Number 4. Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers Paul Rudd Tommy Doyle in the Halloween film franchise has been played by multiple actors. Originally played by Brian Andrews in the original Halloween and played most recently by Anthony Michael Hall in Halloween Kills. However, in between those two films, Paul Rudd played Tommy in arguably the worst of all the Halloween films. Listen, we can argue about that all day. But Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, we're dealing with the fact that instead of Michael Myers just being a boogeyman who is pure evil and kills just because, we're introduced to Thorn, a druidic group who believes in a curse that afflicts Michael Myers and makes him kill on Halloween night. Throw this one out. Number five, Children of the Corn Five, Fields of Terror. Eva Mendez. Children of the Corn 5 is not nearly as good as Urban Harvest, but it's not bad if you enjoy straight-to-video schlock from the late 90s. This movie currently holds a 3.9 on the IMDb scale, and I think that's about right. However, it's worth watching, if only for a very young Mendez, as well as a very young Alexis Arquette. Number 6. He Knows You're Alone Tom Hanks These days, Tom Hanks is one of the most respected actors in Hollywood. It's rare that folks talk about Bosom Buddies, which is a sitcom that ran from 1980 to 82, where Tom Hanks and Peter Scolari dress like women so they are eligible to live in a cheap apartment. They rarely even talk about Bachelor Party from 1984, where he plays Rick, a hard-partying bachelor, 
and his one last night of freedom at a party that involves drugs, drinks, and whores. To be honest, He Knows You're Alone is his very first credit on IMDb, and although he would become a Hollywood A-lister, he doesn't really make much of an impression in this one. Number 7, Cutting Class, Brad Pitt. Though this was early in Pitt's career, this was not his first foray into horror. He started an episode of Freddy's Nightmares, you know, I tried to watch Freddy's Nightmares about a year ago, it does not hold up. Anyhow, Cutting Class actually has a great cast, which also includes Jill Sholin, Roddy McDowell, and Donovan Leach. The movie itself is a pretty tame whodunit slasher movie, but it's worth watching, if only for these young actors. Number 8. Phenomena. Jennifer Connelly. Argento got his hands on Jennifer Connelly even before she challenged the Goblin King for the life of her little brother. This is kind of a strange one. Not only does Jennifer's character have the ability to communicate with insects, but Donald Pleasant plays a doctor with a chimpanzee as a sidekick. All the while a serial killer is going ham around a Swiss boarding school. Number 9. Leprechaun. Jennifer Aniston. At the time of this filming, Leprechaun, which was released in 1992, Warwick Davis had already started in such blockbusters as Return of the Jedi, Labyrinth, and Willow. In this film, he joins Jennifer Aniston, whose only feature film role had been as a bystander in Mac and Me. I'm actually surprised that since this film launched a film franchise that currently has seven sequels, it only has a 4.8 on IMDb. Admittedly, I prefer some of the sequels to this one, but mainly because I still can't stand the sight of Francis Buxton. I'm still mad at what he did to Pee Wee's bike. Number 10, Critters 3. Leonardo DiCaprio. Leo! Those of us who are advanced in our years have known that Leo has been a star for as long as we can remember. He was a child actor and was all over the television in the mid 80s. Though he was in this film from 1991, his big film break came as portrayal of Arnie in What's Eating Gilbert Grape from 1993. The rest is history. What the dickens is going on around here? Who was driving it? I don't know. Curtis! It's coming after us! What is going on? I don't know! You want a war? You got one. I just want to get the hell out of here. You're going to get us in an awful lot of trouble, man. We already in trouble. Maximum terror. Jesus coming and he is. Maximum king. Maybe tomorrow will be our world again. Dino De Laurentiis presents Stephen King's. Maximum Overdrive. Five years ago, Stephen King and George Romero, two masters of the macabre, created their hallmark of horror, Creepshow. Many would argue that nothing of significance has happened since. Until now. Maybe you don't get out much. Oh, this is crazy. This is totally crazy. Maybe you're always running late. I gotta go. Or maybe you just have other things on your mind. They gotta make me a movie star. But if you only make it to one scary film all year, make it one you remember all year long. (laughs) Creepshow 2. If you like movies that will keep you stuck to your chair. <laughs> Stephen King and George Romero have conjured up an all-new creep show. No! It's impossible! Just for you. I mean, what is it? I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know. So don't just sit there. <gasps> I'm gonna swim for it right now. Walk. <laughs> Run. Swim if you have to. I got you! Because the
the scares come twice as quickly in... I beat you! Creep Show 2. Reach for the... Our goal is to satisfy your visual appetite and to give you a fix for your visual addiction. Watching TV and I'm feeling okay. Uh, well, hopefully we've, we've shown you things you haven't seen before. Uh, things that make you just go, what the hell was that all about? the name for this next round this is a family show yeah i know it is but guess what sometimes you just step outside of that box to give the people the kind of trivia that they want to play you named it genitals yeah well guess what sometimes genitals are very scary and this round is all about those scary genitals oh, i hope the little cadavers never see this yeah i feel like that's fair enough <laughs> Question number one. Which Shakespearean satire distributed by Troma features a giant penis with a face? Question number two. What 2007 film is about a young woman who suffers from vagina dentata? Question number three. Who directed the movie Bad Biology 2008, whose climax includes a severed mutant penis attacking nubile females? Question number four. In Tetsuo, the Iron Man, what tool is our protagonist's penis? Question number five. What happens to Jack Anders' penis at the end of Cannibal Holocaust? Question number six. 
Question number six. What 2009 Lars von Trier film shows the doom of Willem Dafoe's genitalia? Question number seven. From what country does Rare Exports that features multiple old skinny man penises take place? Question number eight. In what 2010 film does Jerry O'Connell's character cry, they took my penis? Question number nine. Who directed 2003's Torch, where a woman getting revenge takes a blowtorch to a guy's wee-wee? Question number 10. In what 1987 film, directed by Jörg Wotogret, shows a woman remove a chair leg and secure it to a corpse's crotch? Number 1. Which Shakespearean satire distributed by Troma features a giant penis with a face? Tromeo and Juliet. Oh boy, what to say about this one? I feel like even though I said the words giant penis with a face, you still don't understand exactly what we're dealing with here. This classic is one of the reasons that Troma has a reputation that it has. Starring Debbie Rochon and is narrated by Lemmy, directed by Lloyd Kaufman and written by James Gunn. This is one you have to see to understand. Number two. What 2007 film is about a young woman who suffers from vagina dentata? Teeth. So I looked up vagina dentata and have found that it's nothing but a cautionary tale from many different cultures discouraging promiscuity and rape. Well, that's a good thing, right? In North America, the Ponca and the Otoe tribe tell a story in which a coyote outwits a wicked old woman who plays teeth in the vaginas of her daughter and another young woman she kept prisoner in order to seduce, kill, and rob young men. Coyote kills the woman and her daughter but marries the other young woman after knocking out the teeth in her vagina except for one blunt tooth that was very thrilling when making love. Ugh, I'll just stop there. Question number three. Who directed the movie Bad Biology 2008 whose climax includes a severed mutant penis attacking nubile females? Frank Henenlotter. Sorry about blatantly using the word climax when talking about a half-human, half-penis mutant baby. I just need to get that out of the way before I get going. We all know Frank Henenlotter's films, Basket Case, Frankenhooker, Brain Damage. We all know that when we go to watch his films, we need to expect weird, slimy, and bizarre. Well, this is no different. This might be his most explicit movie, and that's saying something. I'll feel a little bit dirty talking about the plot, so just go and watch it, will you? Number four. In Tetsuo the Iron Man, what tool is our protagonist's penis? A motorized drill. The first time I saw this, I was truly freaked out. Like I'd never seen anything like this, and I don't know if I've seen anything like it since. The story isn't really told in the traditional manner. This film is more of a conceptual and experimental telling of a man who slowly starts to become a being of metal parts, including this drill weed. Presented in black and white, this looks more like a 67 minute hardcore industrial music video than a movie that we typically watch. 
Number 5. What happens to Jack Anders' penis at the end of Cannibal Holocaust? It's cut off by a native. We all heard about how Ruggiero Diodato was brought up on obscenity charges because the local magistrate thought it was a snuff movie. He was only cleared after the, he had proven to the magistrate that the producer and actors were all alive and well. We've heard of the animal cruelty issues with this film, however I think the most shocking thing about the making of this movie was hearing about Diodato's behavior towards the actors. Hearing interviews about how the actors were treated by Diodato was straight up abuse. He screamed at them, alienated them, all to get what he wanted. There was also some other controversy when it came to filming. I won't go into it, but it's really bad. I guess that negative energy was used and put into the quintessential cannibal film to make it all legendary. Number 6. What 2009 Lars von Trier film shows the doom of Willem Dafoe's genitalia? Antichrist. Well, if his films are any indication, Lars von Trier is a weird dude. This movie is exhibit A when it comes to supporting that claim. Willem Dafoe and Charlotte Gainsbourg play parents who neglected to save their child from falling out a window to his death. To say this film is sad would be an understatement. In fact, Von Trier filmed this immediately following a two-month stint in a mental hospital for depression. Well, all that being said, I find it hard to believe that Dafoe would ever be sad. He's so well endowed that Von Trier had a stunt littler dick stand in for the penis scenes. Apparently his thang so big that Von Trier thought that that'd be too distracting for the audience. Number 7. From what country does Rare Exports that features multiple old skinny man penises take place? Finland. You know those Scandinavian Nordic countries up there have some pretty awesome Christmas traditions. They generally think differently than those of us in the United States and North America. I have to wonder about this one though. Rare Exports is almost a fantasy film for young people. I wonder what they were thinking when they decided to add a bunch of old man dick. Ah well, you may never know. Number 8. In what 2010 film does Jerry O'Connell's character cry, They took my penis! Piranha, or Piranha 3D. Although this film is supposed to be comedic and schlocky, I actually really enjoyed it. A prehistoric species of piranha are let loose on the unsuspecting spring break destination. As you'd expect, where there are a bunch of hard partying college students, there is debauchery and boobies. And where there is debauchery and boobies, there are those who want to exploit it by filming and profiting off it. Enter Jerry O'Connell's character. He played the sleazebag perfectly. It's just a shame his dick got ate off. Number 9. Who directed 2003's Torched, where a woman getting revenge takes a blowtorch to a guy's wee-wee? Ryan Nicholson. Ryan Nicholson was notorious for his over-the-top themes and gore in his movies. He was a special effects makeup artist turned filmmaker. Nothing was sacred when it came to Nicholson's film, and Torch is no exception. Sadly, Nicholson passed away in 2015 from cancer, but he will always be remembered for his unique style of filmmaking. Number 10. In what 1987 film, directed by George Budgreit, shows a woman remove a chair leg and secure it to a corpse's crotch? Necromantic. Man, I cannot come within 15 feet of an egg salad sandwich any time I'm watching a Budgreit movie for fear that I'll barf. Necromantic Parts 1 and 2 have to be two of the grossest movies I have ever seen. Not only is the subject matter just awful, but the special effects are slimy and gross. I can almost smell them. I think that icing on the cake with this film is, it looks almost underground and amateur. I'm not saying the cinematography or acting is bad, I'm saying that the film itself has a very distinct and underground feel to it. To me, these are so gross that they feel a little bit illegal. So I hope that last episode didn't traumatize you as much as it traumatized me. Listen, the trauma is not coming from the trivia. It's coming from the movies that the trivia was all about. Uh, anyways, thanks for playing this round. <laughs> Make sure you check out check us out at horrorpubtrivia.com. Uh, go there. You can catch our socials there. You can see what's going on with the show. Uh, most importantly, you can check out some of our other projects as well. So we will let you go. And we will see you in round three. I'm Mike Cadaver. And I'm Betty Cadaver. Bye. Your I see you trapped and caught in two days, it's only one day. This Christmas clip in that
Yeah, we can do